I want to try something I've never done before. Rashi is the beginning of the commentaries um, that we have written. And Rashi is given uh, respect, which puts him in another class entirely than all the other commentaries. When I was early on learning Gemara, my thought was, I'll learn through the Gemara, or a certain section, and I'll try to figure it out, and then I'll read the commentaries and see what they say, and see where I made mistakes, and see where, where I have to change my mind and what I can learn from them. And I was told by several people that that's a mistake. You don't read the Gemara without Rashi. There is no such thing. Rashi comes first. Rashi is part of learning the Gemara first time. That's not true for any other commentary, just Rashi. So I asked two people. I asked um, Yosef Frankel, who is a great Hasidic, he's a Hasidic Rebbe, and he's a son-in-law of, of my, my Rebbe Zatzal. And he said, of course, you don't read the Gemara without Rashi. And then I asked Rabbi Meisman, from whom I learned a great deal, who was a brisker, and he said, of course, you don't read the Gemara without Rashi. Now, if you got a Hasidish on one side and a brisker on the other side, they're both telling the same thing. That's Al Pishnayim Aiden Yochum Dovar. It's very, very likely to be true. So Rashi has this very special um, position. Then there is a statement which is quoted in the name of Rabbeinu Tam, who was one of Rashi's grandchildren, that Rashi's commentary on the, on the Talmud, Rabbeinu Tam says, I could imagine how he did that. But his commentary on the Tanakh, I can't imagine how he did that. So his commentary on the Tanakh has to be something absolutely astounding and special. Um, and as a matter of fact, Rashi's commentary on Chumash has attracted at least a hundred super commentaries. At least a hundred authors dedicated themselves to try to explain what Rashi says. And in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a text of the Chumash with Rashi and 11 of the main commentaries on Rashi in that text. So um, Rashi's comments deserve a tremendous amount of thought. And uh, I'm not claiming that I, I understand everything perfectly, and, uh, uh, but at least we'll, we'll get started. Um, now, sometimes Rashi's commentary is called pshat. He himself calls it pshat. Um, the word pshat is hotly debated and discussed and analyzed. For our purposes, I'm going to start with a simplistic, primitive concept. Pshat is roughly what an intelligent reader could get from the text using the standard tools that you would use, like a dictionary, um, to figure out, what, uh, to be informed of what the words mean. And of course, he's not going to quote it out of context. And here's the terrible news. The context of any verse in the five books of Moses is the five books of Moses, all of it. Actually, the context is bigger. Because as you'll see, references are made to outside the five books of Moses, to a whole of the thousand pages of the Tanakh, in terms of understanding the words. But it's... Even the Torah Shabbat, no? No. No. Not the Torah Shabbat. Rashi does not rely on the oral tradition at all. He brings things from the oral tradition, but he doesn't rely on it. When Rashi quotes a section, something from the oral tradition, he's not saying, I'm using it in my commentary because it's in the oral tradition. What he's saying is, the oral tradition expresses what I, in terms of what I want from my commentary, um, wanted to say about this verse. Uh, there are many places, for example, where the oral tradition will have three coordinated comments on three different verses, and Rashi will bring that piece of the oral tradition on two of them and not the third. There are places where the oral tradition will express an idea on one verse, and he'll apply it to a different verse, not where the, not where the Talmud or the Midrash put it. And there are many places where the oral tradition has comments on the verses, and Rashi will ignore them entirely and create his own, which are not in the oral tradition before him at all. 
The Rashi's, as, well, as I'm going to show you, that's what I'm going to do. We're going to go through one Rashi today on, in, in, in detail. Rashi's commentary is a matter of using logic and normal literary resources to figure out what the text means. I'm saying, I'm saying but doesn't the Torah uh, reference the oral tradition? It alludes to the oral tradition sometimes. It says, sure, so, yeah. but that's not what Rashi's doing. He's doing something else. I'm saying, can you say that's the context of the, of the Pasuk? So just like the context of the Basuk is, is the five books that Moses used. Well, now you used, the, see, you said that's the context of the Pasuk. But I would say that's a context of the Pasuk, not the Part of context of the Pasuk. And I, maybe I should say just a word to, to orient you to where, because this is your com- where you're coming from. Um, the tradition tells us that the text of the Torah, the, of the, all of the written Torah, which would include all of the books of the Tanakh, communicates to us in many different dimensions simultaneously. Many different dimensions simultaneously. They're different. They have different messages. So the other thing as the context. There are many contexts, and each context contains a different message, and all of them are intended by the author. It's a multi-layered text. And Rashi is doing pshat, and he's not doing the other ones. You may have heard of Pardes, Pshat, Ramesh, Drush, and Sot. That's four different contexts in which the verses are understood. And Rashi says, I'm doing Pshat, I'm doing Pshat, and I'm not doing Drush, Ramesh, and Sot. So the Drush will say something else, as we'll see right away. He starts with Drush, and then he differentiates what he's doing from Drush. So the, the oral tradition is very largely Drush, the open oral tradition. I'm not talking about the Nista now. And, uh, and Rashi said, That's not what I'm doing in my commentary. Okay, so let's. Then the second, Rashi's second uh, um, comment on the Torah, he lays out his methodology, which I think is you know, a reasonable thing for an author to do. He has uh, a study with, which has a method. He lays it out. This is uh, roughly a, a translation of what he says, and I'll be commenting on, on, on what he says uh, all the way through. And feel free to stop me because I, this is my this is the the so the foundation point of of the whole the whole dis- discussion. As I, I didn't instruct the office how big to make it, so maybe for you it's no problem. <laughs> now let me put on my reading glasses and see if I can see what's going on. Put it to there. Okay, so now the the bold is what Rashi quotes from the verse. Rashi starts his comment by quoting something from the verse, and that's what he's talking about. <coughs> And here, the English translation is really very good. In the beginning of God's creation of. And in Hebrew, it's breshis bara, those two words, which are printed there in Hebrew. And Rashi says immediately, this verse calls for a midrashic interpretation. The literal words in Rashi are, this, wor- this verse calls out, explain me, analyze me. Drush in Hebrew, lidrosh means to demand, to analyze, to investigate. That's what drush means. So a midrashic interpretation here would mean you must investigate this. There's something here that needs investigation, something that on the surface is problematic. And this, by the way, is the standard way of understanding Rashi. You always start by asking what's bothering Rashi. He, He makes a comment because something needs help. Something's difficult. Something's problematic. And the range of things that can be problematic is unlimited. It could be psychology, it could be history, it could be verbal, it could be legal, it could be the order of the, of the, of the, of the events, it could be uh, the, if there's a better word to have used, why did they use this word rather than the better word? Uh, there's no limit to the kinds of questions you could ask about, about a text, and uh, Rashi's alive on all of those dimensions. This verse calls out for a midrashic interpretation. Why is that? Now here the translator puts in quite correctly, because according to its simple interpretation, if you take the words from a dictionary, the vowelization of the word bara should be different. Because bara means created, past tense, verb. So the literal translation of the first two words would be, in the beginning of God created. In the beginning of God created. 
He can't say that. He can't say that in English. He can't say it in Hebrew. It's nonsensical. So if you're like a beginning student, and you say, okay, Breshis will open it up. Breshis with the base in front. Uh huh. What's that say? It says, in the beginning of. Okay, now, bara. Bara. Oh, yes, that's the verb. Past tense, singular, created. And now the two words together are, in the beginning of, he created. Really? Something's wrong. As written, those words are not understandable. Okay. And now Rashi says, as our, as our rabbi stated, here's my first reaction, says Rashi. My first reaction to this problem is, and then he gives the, what they say, that it should be read, for the sake of the Torah, which is be called, called the beginning of his way, and for the sake of Israel, who are called the first of his grain. Meaning as follows. The base in Hebrew has multiple uses. And one of the uses of the base in Hebrew is to express the, the, the meaning for the sake of, express the meaning of a purpose. For example, when Jacob uh, goes to find a wife and he takes up residence with his uncle Lovan, he says to him, I will serve you for seven years for the sake of Rachel, your younger daughter. And the for sake of, for the sake of is that base. So the Midrash says, take the base of Bereshis as meaning for the sake of Rashis, he created. There's no of in there anymore. The of has disappeared. That's good. Your of has disappeared. Okay, now, for the sake of what? Well, the text says Rashis. Mm, what's that? That's the one that had the of in it. So now the Midrash says, take the word Rashis as a code word for Rashis used elsewhere in the thousand pages of the Tanakh. Scour all the thousand pages of Tanakh and see if you can find a use of the word Rashis which would be relevant to stick in here. And you do. You find two of them. In one case, the Torah is called Rashis. So where it says Rashis here, put in Torah. Torah there is called Rashis. Here you have the word Rashis. Put Torah in here. Another place the Jewish people are called Rashis. And here you have Rashis. So put the Jewish people in here. And now you get, for the sake of the Torah, for the sake of the Jewish people, God created heavens and earth. That's the Midrashic comment. Rashi puts that first. This is very, very important because this is not what Rashi is doing in his commentary. This is not what he's doing. He says immediately, but if you wish to explain it according to his pshat, you have to do something entirely different, disconnected, with no reference to that whatsoever. See, here you have this comment as a comment in Chazal. That's for the sake of. So what is Rashi telling us? Rashi is telling us that drush is true, it's valid, it's holy, it's divine, it's, it's fundamental, it communicates fact, which is, which, is, which is absolute fact. It's just that I'm not doing that in my commentary. He gives rab the rabbis pride of place. He puts them first. And I think Rashi may be working uphill here against a certain prejudice. And I think this prejudice is very widespread today. And I don't know how it was uh, uh, 900 years ago. But the prejudice that you, that you find in people is, Rabbi, there are words on the page, right? It's a book. Okay, you read a book. The book says what the words say. That's what the book says. Everything else that you put in as interpretation is fluff. You made it up. It's just a matter of interpretation. It's subjective and it's politicized and uh, it's prejudicial. Pay attention to the words, Rabbi, because that's what the words, that's what the, word, the book really means. <coughs> well, no. Who says the, the words are more important than anything else that the book has to say or the book has to communicate? Pieces of literature exist in a culture in a certain context, and they have different, different uh, roles. They have different, uh, different uh, purposes to serve. Some will take Shakespeare's plays, Romeo and Juliet, and say, I don't believe that Romeo ever spoke those words to Juliet. I don't think it happened. So Shakespeare is just lying. You'll tell him, listen, <laughs> this is a play, you know. This isn't a history book. It's not an encyclopedia. It's a play. Of course they didn't speak those words. That's not what Shakespeare is doing recording historical fact. He's explaining human emotions and, human and, and political situations and values and tragedies. And he made up the words. Of course he did. So what? Here, it's not meant to be fact. 
So you have to ask yourself, for each piece of literature in any culture, what role does this piece of literature have? I'm telling you, I'm says this word for word, I'm telling you that this one p- book has many different levels going on simultaneously. So Rashi says, I want you to know that I have, I have no false pretense that what I'm doing is more important, more valid, more true than, whatever, than all the other dimensions, in particular Drush, upon which the, uh, rabbinic, the rabbis of the Talmudic period spent a great deal of time and effort. It's true, it's holy, it's valid. I'm just not doing that. I'm doing something else called Pshat. That's why I think he put it first. Are we together so far? Yeah. Okay. So now let's see how the Pshat works. Don't explain it with the Pshat. Explain it thus. At the beginning of the creating of heaven and earth, I, heaven got it twice, the earth was astonishing, astonishing with emptiness and darkness, and God said, let there be light. That's the first three verses. So, the problem was, from the dictionary, it, mean, it reads, in the beginning of, God created, in the beginning of, and then a verb, can't do that, after the of has to come, a noun, right? In the beginning of the baseball game, in the beginning of the symphony, in the beginning of the war, it's, it's got to be, right? The beginning of Moby Dick, I mean, there's got to be a noun there, if the of takes a noun. And in grammar, it's taking a verb. In the grammar of the verse in the Torah, in the Torah it's taking a verb. It's just, it's just grammatically inconsistent. Rashi says, let's substitute for. He created, let's substitute creating. Okay, now time for a small grammar lesson. Creating, the word creating, is a verb or a noun? It's a gerund. In this case, it's a noun. It's a gerund, that's right, but it's a gerund, a verb, or a noun. (coughs) Well, let's try it out. A noun noun is something which can stand at the beginning of a sentence. It can be the subject of a sentence, right? Right. How about creating is hard work? Creating pays well. Creating is very rare, and so forth and so on. Can creating stand at the beginning of a sentence? Yes. Of course it can. Creating is the name of a process. It's a name. You can't say John creating. It's not a verb, like John walk, John walks, or John, right? You have creates, but not creating. You put an is in, you've converted the, vow, the, the noun into a verb. Yeah, is creating, but you need the is. Without the is, it doesn't work. Creating is a noun. So now, you say the beginning of God's creating, that reads fine. God's creating is a thing, and the beginning of that thing. In this case, the thing is a process. So Rashi is suggesting that we read it differently. Now, the objection will be, but that's not what it says, Rashi. I mean, you know, okay, you, you know, there are places who do that. You know, so it says this, so what? We'll make it up that way. But you can't do that. And Rashi knows that. So Rashi immediately addresses that problem. He says, oh, before that, he makes a comment here, which is, which is very important. Scripture did not come to teach the sequence of the creation to say that these came first. Let's read it the way Rashi reads it. In the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, this was the situation. Uh, the earth was astonishingly empty, and darkness was in the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. That's the situation. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So what's the first thing that God did? Maybe, but in the text, what's the first action that the the text records? Creating light. Creating light. All the rest of that is backdrop. In the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, here was the situation. Okay, nothing's happened yet. You're just describing the situation. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And Rashi says, the way I'm translating it, you don't start with time zero. Rashi's pointing this out. Doesn't want the critic to figure it out and throw a brick at him. No, I'm telling you right away. We're not starting at time zero. This isn't in the beginning God created heavens and earth. No, in the beginning of God's creating heavens and earth, this was the situation, and God said, let there be light. Okay. Okay. 
Now, and he explains his reason for this, because he says, there's no rashis in scripture that is not connected to the following word. Because, as I told you, rashis has an of in it. As for example, in the beginning of the reign of Yahim. In the beginning of his reign. Beginning of your corn. The first of your corn. All of them have a noun coming afterward. And here you need a noun. So he's putting in a noun, creating, created, to creating. I, you'll ask me, but it doesn't say that. Now here's, here's where he addresses it. Here too you can say, braces bar lokim should be read as if it were pointed bro instead of bara, getting a creating. And I'll show you a similar uh, 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 sentence to this in another place in the Tanakh. This is in the second verse of the book of Hosea. It's the beginning of God's speaking to Hosea. But there, the word of speaking is deber, and deber is a, is a verb. So Rashi is telling you, what you have here is what we would call in modern English an idiom. You have words which have a certain meaning, even contrary to their normal grammar. Um, and and I, in the case of the second verse of Isaiah, of Hosea, it's, it's inescapable. Tchilas dibra Hashem behoshea. Tchilas means beginning of. The tough at the end makes it of. And dibra is he spoke. Beginning of God, he spoke to. Can't do that. So he says, clearly, this is a biblical idiom where you have, in particular, beginning of, and then a verb, change the verb into a gerund, into an ing, and then you make it into a noun, and then you can fix the grammar. So Rashi's telling you, I know I'm doing violence to the grammar here. Well, if you are, you have to justify it. As I'll justify it for you. 600 pages later, in this thousand-page book, there's a completely parallel uh, structure, and there you're forced to say that that's what the text is saying, and that's why I think it's legitimate to say that that's what the text means here. You get it so far? Rabbi, so if, I, if I'm not mistaken, so the, the Peshat <coughs> is not stated in the most ideal way, but therefore it calls for a Jew. Well, no, because not in Rashi's terminology. The Jewish was for the sake of the of the Torah and for the sake of the Jewish people. That he's not doing that. So I'm sure in that in that in that pasuk in in Tanakh where it talks about Diber Tchil Diber and Hoshea, yeah. there's also a Jewish that explains why the Peshat. Well, uh, at this point, the word Jewish is very flexible, and there are at least 17 different ways it can be used. So I wouldn't complain. And you're using the word that way, but Rashi's not using the word that way because he told us that. Uh, Drush is for the sake of the Jewish people and for the sake of the Torah, and he's not doing Drush, he's doing Pshat. So his, his use of the word Drush is not that. But I'm sure you could say the same Pshat that Rashi is saying in a more grammatically correct way. No. That's another question. That's an interesting question. That is an interesting and the, question. And the fact that the Torah didn't say it in the most grammatically consistent way calls for the Drush. Not this Drush. Well, I don't know. It calls for this Drush. It calls for a Drush. Maybe that's 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 not a, that's a, that's an interesting point. I, I usually put that in later. This, this there, there, there are two really there are two really two two different questions, and sometimes Rashi addresses this. Uh, let, let me say it since you since you brought it up. The the question we've been asking so far is what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it say? Okay, and you struggle with the words and comparative context and other things that you'll see that he brings in as as he goes along. But then you can ask, why did the text choose these words to make this meaning? Mm. I mentioned that actually before, mm. right? And that's a separate question. That doesn't cast doubt on what it means. It means what it means. But then why did the text use these words? To, and that can sometimes indicate that there's extra information that is coded in the text. So, so I, that, that's a legitimate thing to do. I didn't see anybody do it here, but it's certainly legitimate. And I have other examples where, where Rashi himself does that. I've seen philosophers use this first pasuk, this fact that, that it's kind of calling for a drasha as proof for there being a, a masora, a Torah Shabbat Peh. Because without... Okay. No. Sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. That's that going much too far afield. The, the, the point here is that the drush doesn't need to stand, although it often does, it doesn't need to stand on difficulties in the pasuk. It may or may not. Rashi is trying to understand what the words mean in terms of logic and open, objective scholarship. Rashi wants to be able to prove what he says is true, not just suggest it as 
an acceptable alternative. He wants to prove, as you'll see, he's going to invent a critic against himself, and he's going to argue against the critic and try to prove the critic is wrong. Mm-hmm. In Jewish, you don't do that, typically. You have this Midrashic interpretation which explains this idea, and he has that much Midrashic that explains that idea. Most often, they don't, they don't argue with one another. In Pshat, they argue all the time, and it started because Rashi started the arguments. So you, you'll see that. Uh, you'll see that. You have a question? So, um, in, the beginning, in the beginning of God's creation of heaven and earth, would we be able to say that, the, that there are properties of heaven and earth that existed before the creation of life? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's what Rashi says. I'm not coming to tell you these were first. I'm not coming to tell you these were first. Now, this is, I mean, Rashi is so, he's so upfront and so honest about this. This is a big loss. Ideologically, theologically, it's a big loss. We believe that the world doesn't go back forever. Um, that was a big surprise in 1965 when they discovered the Big Bang. They resisted it for thousands of years. We says it doesn't go back, we say it doesn't go back forever. Wouldn't it be nice if the beginning of our book, the words would say explicitly that there's a beginning and God started at the beginning? Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be convenient? Yeah, it would be, but that's not what Pshat does. Pshat doesn't do that. Pshat's not interested in your convenience. Pshat's not interested in the ramifications for your ideology. Pshat is what the words say. Deal with it later. Don't pretend and don't, fun, don't uh, fake what the, what the words say. This is based on what the words say. It doesn't say that there's a definitive point from where the heaven and earth was created. It says that for light, it's just saying that the, the act, of, act, act of creating heaven and earth, uh, light came to be. Am I understanding correctly? I'm here, but I don't see how that relates to what you said before. You were talking before about how this interpretation that we're holding to is we're able to say that there isn't a definitive start point to. Uh, I, I mean, I'm misinterpreting this song. I mean, how, how does this, how does this, how does this interpretation we're showing prove uh, that uh, there wouldn't be a definitive beginning, maybe? No, it's, no, no, no. The text is not addressing whether or not there was a definitive beginning. It's just not starting at the definitive beginning. It's not starting there. It's starting in the middle of the story. Does the story go back forever? Was there a beginning to the story? Who knows? The text is not interested in that. The text is interested in starting here and going forward. That's what Rashi's telling us, yeah. Okay, I mean, I, I didn't get there. I mean, we, we, it's so, uh, I haven't read that yet, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, what you mean, just speaking to O'Shea. Yes, um, you, you have to understand that, well, this is, this is a long topic in and of itself. Um, the text in hundreds of places describes God in physical terms and in human terms. Hundreds of places. Obviously, since God dictated the words, the letters to Moses, letter by letter, and most likely dictated the words to the prophets. There's, there's some discussion of it, but uh, I think many hold that he dictated the words to the prophets. He wanted to be described in that way. Now, literally speaking, those descriptions are false. There's a whole long discussion. <coughs> Ramah discusses this at length in the Moran Nebuchim um, as to why it, was, why it was done that way. But I would, uh, just to sort of soften the ground for you a little bit, uh, we do this in our everyday talk all the time, um, our vocabulary for mental objects is derived, and therefore it is all, almost all metaphorical. Um, we call difficult questions hard questions. Will they scratch diamonds or will they not scratch diamonds? That's the, that's the definition of hardness of a, of a material, whether it'll scratch another material. I talk about deep ideas, six miles deep, 15 miles Sorry, deep, you know? That's a far out, you know, it's a far out hypothesis, you know. Far out, how far out? 16 light years? I mean, we use physical language for our mental life because the talk of mental life comes very late in a person's development, comes late in a culture's development, and you borrow the words that you have available to you. So hard things resist pressure. Hard questions resist intellectual effort. So you borrow the word and use it that way. So the idea of borrowing words is part and parcel of our 
uh, of our vocabulary in, in describing the world all the time. And that being the case, um, it's not shocking that we should do it with respect to Akash Baruch Hu. It's more systematic, more far, uh, far-reaching in it, and has more far-reaching consequences. All that's true. But in the meantime, I don't think we should uh, worry about it too much. Yes, God doesn't speak in the way that we do by create. Although, he doesn't speak with vocal cords. You said that well. He could, he could create... Um, uh, he, could, no, he could create sound waves. True. Sound waves are systematic <coughs> motions of, of particles of air. Right? He could certainly create that. Or he can create the experience of hearing a voice in a person, either way. And then for God, that would be called speaking. Right? But, but that's, a long, that's a long, complicated subject. Okay. Mm. So now, what we have so far is, Rashi's telling you, yes, in strict grammar, it's not, um, it, it, it would be inconsistent beginning of he created. But idiomatically, this is what it means, and he proves that that's so. By the way, it's not the only place where, where, where things are used idiomatically in the Tanakh. It's used quite often in the Tanakh. Now, he invents a critic. Ma piton, as we say in modern Hebrew. If you say, first of all, you object to my cutting out the beginning. You say, no, Rabbi, we're not doing that. If you say, he came to teach that these were created first. So then you have to face the grammatical issue that I had to face. And that its meaning is, in the beginning of all, there's a missing word, Rabbi, there's a missing word here. Sometimes the, Torah, the Tanakh doesn't put in all the words. It trusts the reader to supply words that will make the context have, be, be complete. And here's one of them. It should just put in the word all. All is a, is a, is a noun. In the beginning of all, the beginning of everything. Put in everything. And I'll prove it to you, Rabbi. You brought a verse from Hosea to support your understanding. I'll bring you a bunch of verses to support my understanding using the same methodology as you. Watch. Job, it says, for did not shut the doors of my mother's womb and does not have, there's no subject in the verse. Lo sagar. Does it explain who shut? Or will plow with cattle? Does it say who? who who's, who's, going to, who's going to plow? Or if a man will plow with cattle? And the like. And, did I skip one? Should, should have. Didn't should have. Uh, yeah, carry off the, 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 will carry off the wealth of Damascus. Doesn't say who will. Doesn't say he. The word he isn't even in the Hebrew text. And the last one, the fourth one from Yeshaya, is the most astonishing one. Literally, telling the end of, from the beginning of. And the word there is reshis. Magid me reshis acharis. So literally means he tells from the beginning of the end of. And the reader breathlessly asks, beginning of what? End of what? And the verse says, figure it out for yourself. Not interested, you know. Fill it in. So you fill in either beginning of everything, to, 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 he tells the end of everything, or beginning of any particular thing, he tells the end of that particular thing. So the critic says, listen, Rashi, you yourself see the very words you're using, the word Rashi's is used elsewhere without any ver- a, a noun coming after it, and it's left up to the reader to fill in the natural insert that will make sense out of the verse. So I say the same thing is going on here. And it means in the beginning of everything. And I save your theology. Because according to me, it's the beginning of everything. We're starting at time zero. Why isn't the r- critic's shot better? But look what the critic is doing. He's answering Rashi in his own terms. He's using Rashi's own methodology. And he's claiming Rashi's wrong. He's wrong. Have a much better understanding of it. So, Rashi says, if you say that Scripture indicates the order of creation, as you said, be astounded at yourself. For the water preceded as it is written, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water. And Scripture did not yet disclose when the creation of water took place. If you read it with everything, it comes out, the beginning of everything God created, heaven and the earth, and the earth was astonishingly empty and and empty and empty and darkness faced the and the Spirit of God hovered over the water. Well, um, excuse me, how did the water get there? In the beginning, he created heaven and earth. Now, I hear you saying, come on, Rabbi, earth 
Does Earth mean dirt? Earth means the planet. And the planet has water on it. What's wrong with that, Rabbi? <laughs> and the answer is, what's wrong with it is verse 10. Where in verse 10, just a few verses away, in verse 10, the Torah defines the word earth. It defines Eretz. It says Eretz is a word for Yabasha, dry land. The very same text says the word Eretz means dry land. So if you want to say it means the planet, you have to bring a proof for that. You have to answer for that. But the clear meaning of it in the context is that it means dry land. And therefore, the critic who wants to save the order of creation, who wants to say it's the beginning of everything, can't explain the context. So what has Rashi done? What resources has he used? He used grammar to start with. Then he used comparative text to justify his reading. He invented a critic who used comparative text to criticize him and, and suggest a better shot, one that saves the theological point. And then Rashi used context to resolve and say that the critic has no, has, uh, cannot hold on to his position. If you put the, the verse in context and see how, how it, what the following verse is, it's impossible to justify. So now, this is, I think, uh, a, a perfect introduction. Can I make a bracha on this? Yeah. Thank you very much. I forgot about it. Now, the way Rashi is going to pursue his, his, um, his, his understanding. Uh, he's going to ask what the words mean. He's going to use these and other similar tools to be able to analyze what the words mean. And the whole of the entire thousand pages of the Tanakh is open to him. And by the way, this is, I think, a, a very interesting his, uh, historical fact. The, the Tanakh covers a period of about 800 years. Hebrew was stable enough over that time the vast majority, there were changes in words, but the vast majority was stable enough so that books in the, uh, words in the book of Proverbs or words in the, in the book of uh, Chronicles or in the, uh, um, in the book of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, those words could be used to analyze the words in, in Genesis. It's a, it's, a, it's a gigantic period of time. Most languages, if you take English books from 600 years ago, you won't be able to understand a word. You know, Chaucer, you know, 800 years ago. You won't be able to understand a word because the language has changed. Here it's stable enough, and when we talk about uh, the context of the, of the verses, the context includes the entire corpus of the Hebrew Bible, so to speak, which, where the words can be compared back and forth, and, uh, and you can arrive at uh, understanding the meaning. Any question? Yes, sir. Sometimes Rashi uses uh, old French word <laughs> Rashi was writing in France. He lived in I France, and he was and he was writing for his readers. And he's trying to ex explain an idea to his readers, so he wrote it in old French because their fluency in Hebrew wasn't enough for him to explain it to them in the way that they'll be able to understand it. By the way, Rashi became a, a major source for old French. Because he recorded Old French 900 years ago. Now, there were not a lot of books coming out of France 900 years ago. <laughs> they have, you know, and, and he's explaining what the words mean. So he gives the Hebrew equivalent, and Hebrew is something we still understand. You can interpret the Fr Old French that way, and then that way they have the source for, for Old French. But that's, he was doing it to communicate with his readers. Sometimes, um, yeah, okay. Sometimes there are usages, even Rashi does this uh, in Arabic, sometimes he quotes from Arabic, uh, more so, let's say, the Ramban and others who lived in Arabic lands, where there's a kind of um, grammatical structure in Hebrew which doesn't have an equivalent anywhere else in the uh, European languages, and it has an, a, a, an equivalent in Arabic. So let's say this word in Hebrew plays the same role as the, that word in, in, in Arabic. So someone who runs on Arabic will feel comfortable with it. He'll be able to use what he knows to understand what, what the Hebrew intent, intends. They do do that a lot, yeah. how you read uh, right to left in Hebrew, and bet 
is closed off to the right. So before the Thor starts, that's closed off to us. And what's happened, that is open to the left, that's where we start focusing our attention going forward from that time. Yes, there is that comment. That comment is made. It, has, it, does, it does have a, a, a legitimate source. It's just a comment that has to be treated carefully. Um, first of all, this is important to put on, on the table. Um, you'll see a statement in the rabbinic writings, all days are Bs. And elsewhere you'll see that there's something which is an A and isn't a B. So it would, it would violate the, the rule that all A's are B's. How should we deal with that? How should we understand that? So Rabbi Yochanan, he was the editor of the Jerusalem Talmud, right in the middle of the Talmudic period, made a statement. We don't learn from general statements. That is to say, general statements in our literature aren't meant to be universal. They're general, but not universal. They tolerate exceptions. And then he went on to say, So you'll have a statement like this. All these are B's except for X, Y, and Z. And you say, well, here the author listed the exceptions, didn't he? So you don't expect PQ and R to be more exceptions, right? Wrong. In our literature, you do expect it. Even in a place where it says, even except for these, there may be other exceptions as well. Now here, we have to be very careful with cultural relativity, and I think there's a certain legitimacy to it, and then it's taken out of its legitimate boundaries and used in, in completely irresponsible ways. But as I indicated before, um, literature is an expression of a culture, and it's subject to the norms of the culture. Uh, and a, a, um, a normal 20th century, at least in, in Western culture, who says all these are bees, takes responsibility that there are no exceptions at all. What Rabbi Yochan is telling us is that's a mistake in understanding Jewish literature. That's not what Jewish literature does. When it says all these are bees, it means typically there are, or there's a good reason why it should be that way, but there could be other reasons that override it. I'll give you an example which Rambam uses, which I think is, is uh, instructive here and also applies elsewhere. Um, we have what are called the laws of nature, whatever they are. It's a big, difficult philosophical subject. But anyway, we talk about the laws of nature. Now, the modern way of dealing with laws is no exceptions. If you discover something that's an exception, then you say, well, we were mistaken. The law is, is that isn't the law. And you have to find out what the law is, put in new, book, new conditions, limit the law in such a way so that you have no exceptions. An exception to a law means the law is false. The Rambam quotes a verse, we say it every morning, chok v'lo yavor, the, the way in which nature operates is a chok which will not pass away. The modern reader, coming from his understanding of how laws work, reads, the laws are absolutely fixed with no exceptions whatsoever. Then they're surprised to find that in the Guide of the Perplex, Maimonides quotes the rabbinic tradition, that when the, when the Messiah comes, there could be Exceptions to the laws. I understand. He quoted the verse that says they won't pass away. And he himself says that there will be exceptions to the laws. And the answer is because the Ramam is not operating with the modern concept of law, which, by the way, if it's modern, it doesn't make it any better. He's operating with a different concept. He's understanding pass away means to stop functioning. Not to tolerate limited exceptions, but to stop functioning. There's no more gravity. Tie everything down with a rope. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So he says in the guide, there could be exceptions that are limited in time and space. That doesn't mean the law has passed away. When it happens here, it's not happening there. It hasn't passed away. It didn't happen for this year and it comes back next year. It didn't pass away. It didn't pass from the scene. It was temporarily interrupted. So the, the usage of the concepts has to be taken into account when you explain the meanings of a statement within, within a culture. It was very important to have Rabbi Yochanan's uh, statement on, on record that, um, that, uh, that we do expect that there will be exceptions. Yeah. I was going to ask, but where is this uh, Rabbi Yochanan saying that the 
Gemara and Erevin, which comments on the statement of the Mishnah, what things you can use for Erev, Erev Tchumen, what kinds of foods you can use. He says this, and, and, and these, and these. And he says, yeah, but there are others also, because it's not, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not absolute. At any rate, um, I want to just answer one more question and then I, uh, for myself, uh, and, and, then, and then I'm going to have to go. And by the way, I'm very sorry that I cannot come tomorrow because of a, a wedding to go to for uh, my grandchild. Thank you very much, but I will see you on Sunday. Um, let's suppose you have two commentators who disagree, and some of them disagree quite uh, literally. One says the other one's statement is false. Lo mukhfar, it's not appropriate. Um, now, we understand that the great commentators, who were also very great spiritual personalities, very pious people, had what's called Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh means divine spirit, which guided them to say the things they said and think the things they thought. And then the question is asked, well, if they all had Ruach HaKodesh, A, say what he said, because he, the Ruach HaKodesh told him to say it, and B, say what he said, because Ruach HaKodesh told him to say it. So how can they contradict? How is that possible? Isn't Holy Spirit true? And one answer is, no. Who says it has to be true? Holy Spirit said, I want you to say this. I want this to be on record. I want this to be part of the tradition. I want this to be dealt with. I want this to be understood as divinely inspired material that has to be registered. But not necessarily to be... To be and it could be that each of them is only partially true and not totally true. For example... You have Beis Hill and Beis Shammai, the House of Hill and the House of Shammai, the two great schools of rabbinic thought. If our medieval commentators had Holy Spirit, they for sure had Holy Spirit. But aside from a certain small list of exceptions, we hold with Beis Hill against Beis Shammai to the extent that the Gemara says, Beis Shammai ain't a Mishnah. The, the view of Beis Shammai that's recorded in the Mishnah doesn't have Mishnahic status doesn't have Mishnahic status. So why is it recorded? Because it's holy. Because great people, great servants of God said so. Because God wants it to be part of the tradition that we study and analyze, and analyze the different pieces of logic and where they came from and how much of it was rejected and how it wasn't rejected, then we won't understand God's Torah unless we deal with this, unless we learn this and analyze this. But it doesn't stop us from saying, at least as far as Halach is concerned, that this, this is the, one, the way that uh, the Allah has decided against that way, the way, the way which is decided. So I think that we have to, uh, we have to take this in the way that the, the culture of the Torah takes it and, and get used to the ways, to the, the methods that it has for dealing with this, with this material. You have a question? No. You have a question? Yes. Just one small thing on what Gerard just said. Um, why is it that we always have to find out Terrence or whatever you call it, or in the chlok is like why, why is that a thing? Because can, can it sometimes be left as like a teiku in the Gemara? And like I, I don't say I what you mean. We don't, we don't try to settle differences of opinion. We try to understand the background for each side in the difference of opinion. When Acharonim analyze Rishonim, typically what they do is to bring out the assumptions of each of the, of the sides so you see where his conclusion was justified for him. And in the end, we understand the Machlechus. What you understand is he had this kind of methodology, and that's where his opinion came from. He had a different methodology, and that's where his opinion came from. And they're both justified, and we don't decide who's right and who's wrong. <coughs> Typically, that's what you do when you, when you analyze uh, a Machlechus. Right? In Psakalochi, you have to paskin. That's, that may be done on, on the basis of, uh, of other ways of, of analyzing it. Like, like who, who, whose side has a majority of the great figures who, uh, who said, but that doesn't mean the others, others aren't, aren't legitimate. It's just that when you have to decide what to do and you can't satisfy both, then you follow the majority, like you did in Sanhedrin, but not with the same, same authority. But um, we're not trying to settle it. By the way, however, even in the Gemara, you may have heard this, but this I'm going to stop. The, uh, when the Gemara decides a legal issue, use the word hilchasa, that's it. Later generations cannot, cannot disagree with that. But very often the Gemara does not decide. 
And then the later generations have to make up their own minds. And even when, for example, you have a position, maybe an objection and an answer, another objection and an answer, another objection and an answer. That's the end of the discussion, okay? Three objections and three answers. So who wins? It's not obvious. It's not obvious. The fact that you had an answer to every objection doesn't mean that the, that the original position wins because you have to evaluate which is stronger, the question or the answer. How ad hoc is the answer? Dohak is what we say in Hebrew. How much do you have to push your logic or push your intuition to accept the answer? Even if you have the same question from three different texts and the same answer three different times, some of the Rishonim will say, yeah, but look, that means all three of these uh, sources left this out and were subject, at least intuitively, to the objection, and all three were relying on this answer, which they didn't write. It happened three times. That weakens your position. So the Rishonim do decide the issue, because they usually have to decide the issue. There's a piece of law here. It has to be decided. And they disagree on how to decide it. So the, the Talmud leaves a lot open. Even when the Gemara has an objection to a position, and the Gemara says kasha, meaning the Gemara doesn't resolve the objection, sometimes later commentaries will resolve the objection. So at the time of the Talmud, the res resolution wasn't, wasn't uh, obvious to them, but later generations could do that. So there's a lot of continuity in the, in the structure, a lot of continuity in the study. The only breaking point is where they say Hilchosa, where that's, that, the halacha is set that way. Maybe we'll study why, why that is. We'll give you the background for that. Okay, wonderful to see you.